Okay, now let's move on and talk about stock or equity. First, we'll think about stock by thinking about the differences between equity and debt. Debt securities represent a legally enforceable claim. So the company has to pay its bonds if it can. And if it can't, the, the bondholders can sue it and force it into bankruptcy. The company owes no such benefits to stockholders. And stockholders know up front that the value of stock will fall to zero if the company fails. And they'll, they'll get nothing. Debt holders can sue the company and after the company goes through bankruptcy and sells off everything, uh, debt holders will typically get pennies on the dollar, 80, 70 cents on the dollar. So that's better than losing your whole investment like you would in a stock. Debt securities offer typically fixed cash flows, fixed income. You know, you get the coupon and that's it. So that's the downside of bonds. You don't, you're not going to get more than your coupon and then your, your principal at the end. Whereas with stocks, it's kind of the sky's the limit. If the company's really successful, uh, the stock price can keep going up and up and up, as you've seen with companies like Apple and Google, for example. Bondholders do not have any control over how the companies run. They're strictly passive investors, whereas stockholders get a, a vote over the board of directors of the company for every share of stock they own. So s significant shareholders, you know, if a shareholder owns 5, 10, 20 percent of the stocks, he could wield significant influence on the board of directors of the company, who's responsible for hiring the executive management. So uh, there's actually a lot of influence by large stockholders in the running of the company, and bondholders have no influence at all. Common stockholders are also known as residual claimants. They're the ultimate owners of the company. So after all the debts of the company are paid, they own what's left. That's what that residual concept means. No claim to earnings or assets until all senior claims are paid in full. The senior claims would be the people the company owes money to. Its employees, wages, uh, its vendors, accounts payable, its creditors, bonds, or bank loans. Higher risk, higher return. As I mentioned, you can see extremely large stock appreciation. There's no limit to it. And as we mentioned, stockholders have voting rights and therefore wield uh, considerable influence. So there's, there's big differences between debt and equity. Debt is more fixed, more senior in its claim, therefore typically has a lower uh, return relative to equity. Equity is much higher risk. It can go to zero. And because of that, it's going to offer higher returns on average in general over a long period of time. Okay, we'll focus on common stock here. Companies do issue different classes of stock, but the most common one is common stock. And this is typically what the public holds through mutual funds or uh, brokerage accounts. And we'll review some terminology just like we had with bonds. Stock has a par value. It's just kind of a bookkeeping entry. It basically has no relevance. Shares authorized is the amount that the board of the company authorized the firm to sell to the public. And uh, the company will usually authorize a certain amount of shares, 100 million shares or 500 million shares or something like that, uh, in its initial public offering, its initial sales of stock to the public. And then if they want to raise more money through equity markets, they can go back and authorize more shares, issue additional shares. The problem with that is that with more shares outstanding, that dilutes the value of every share. So the company has to be really careful about that if they want to go do a secondary offering of stock because they erode the share price for the current stockholders. The number of shares issued, they don't have to issue all the ones that are authorized. So a company might authorize 100 million shares, but only issue 80 million of them. And that means they have 20 million that they could issue uh, without needing a new authorization from the board or the stockholders. And that's the shares outstanding. And then additional paid in capital is just the difference of the money the company received above its par value for the sale of its stock. Stockholders can vote, one vote per share. Sometimes you see proxy fights, which is attempt to influence stockholders to vote in a certain way to change the board of directors. But shareholders have no legal rights to receive dividends. So when a company gets in trouble, the first thing they'll do is cut its dividends. And of course, that's going to reduce the value of stocks. As with bonds, stocks are issued in primary markets and then traded amongst investors in secondary markets. Market capitalization refers to the total number of shares outstanding times the current price per share. And you can look at that as kind of the market's valuation of the company. Treasury stock are shares that the company repurchased. Often companies will repurchase their own stock in order to boost the price. They, they might not have anything else to do with uh, retained earnings, so they can repurchase shares, reduce the number of shares outstanding, and that tends to boost the value of outstanding shares. Okay, so let's talk about valuation of, of common stock. 
An investor buys a stock today for a price P0, receives a dividend of V1 at the end of one year, and immediately sells the stock for P1. The return on the investment is simply the dividend received. Remember, that's a share of the profits. It's divided amongst all stockholders plus the change in the value. Now, that could be appreciation if the value goes up. If P1 is higher than P0, it could be a decline. It could be depreciation. So we'll just call this change delta in value. And we divide it by the initial price. So hopefully you get both the dividend and some appreciation. And so your total return is the amount of the dividend and the, the share price growth divided by your initial price. The value of a share of stock in this sense then is the value of the dividend plus the future value of the share discounted back to now. You know, what, what does this look like? Well, we're dividing the future amounts by the discount factor. So this is just a present value calculation applied to the stock. So you'll see this uh, recurring concept here. When we value assets, regardless of whether they're bond stocks, real estate, or an entire business, we're always going to use some version of the present value formula. Okay, and let me just, I'll briefly mention here, I don't think we're going to do a whole lot of homework problems like this, but I'll, I'll note that when we're talking about a stock that pays a constant stream of dividends each year, so it pays a dividend in, in year one, year two, year three, year four, and on and on, well, that kind of looks like the bond's coupon, doesn't it? So the valuation procedure is going to be pretty much exactly the same as valuing a bond. The difference is that stocks last forever, whereas bonds have a maturity date. So the formula is going to be a little bit different. And this is this is going to go on into perpetuity. And if the dividend indeed never changes, we can use the perpetuity formula, which is we just divide the dividend by the uh, required return or a discount rate. The the difficulty with that is that dividends can rise and fall depending on the depending on how the company fares out of, out there in the market. And so it's a little shaky maybe to apply, to assume the dividends will go on forever. Another problem is that some companies, in fact, a lot of companies, pay no dividends, or they might pay dividends sometimes, but then, but then scale back the dividends in other times. So, how do we dis, how do we value companies that don't have dividends? Well, we're still going to use the present value method, discounted cash flows. We just have to make a little alteration, and that's called the free cash flow method. And this this will be a procedure for valuing an entire business as well. So here's how the free cash flow approach works. We take the net amount of cash flow remaining after all the operating needs and investments have been paid for. So basically the net income, the profits. And that represents the cash that the firm can pay to its investors. And that's ultimately why people invest in a company, right? They want to be paid. They want a return on their investment. The weighted average cost of capital, the concept we're not going to get into, but we can just summarize it. It represents the rate of return that investors in the company require. And of course, there's a difference between debt and equity. So the, the weighted average depends on the particular company's mixture of debt and equity financing. Debt rate of return is typically lower than the equity rate of return for reasons we mentioned. Debtors have a contractual obligation to be paid, whereas equity holders, stockholders don't. So there's a mixture of different rates of return required depending on debt versus equity. And then even within equity, we didn't get into the distinctions, but there's preferred stock and common stock. So there could be some different uh, required yields within there. But basically, we do a weighted average of the return required by debt holders and the return required by equity holders, and that's going to represent the minimum rate of return required by investors in this company, and that's what we're going to use as our discount rate. So the, the weighted average cost of capital feeds into the valuation model as the discount rate, the interest rate we're using, the rate of return we're, we're using in our present value formula. So we estimate the free cash flow over time, and that's tricky the farther we get into the future. We, we might be pretty confident about the company's prospects over the next few years, but once we get 10, 20 years down the road, that becomes really tricky. We're going to discount it according to that weighted average cost of capital, as I just mentioned, and that gives us the total value of the firm. And then we subtract out the debt and any other obligations to obtain the value of the equity. Divide that value by the number of shares outstanding, and that gives us an idea of what the uh, per share value should be. And here's an example of that in practice. Starbucks Corp, which we're all familiar with, it's uh, it grew rapidly. It's it's still growing rapidly uh, in international markets. So it's it's a very growth-oriented company. And here's what they looked like in 06. They had about 250 million in debt, no preferred stock, so that makes this problem a little easier. 765 million shares of common stock, and cash flow of 270 million. So revenues and operating profits were growing at 21%. Really strong growth for this company. 
So what we'll do is take their free cash flow and basically apply an assumption about the growth rate. 20% free cash flow growth over the time period in, in question. And then we'll scale that down to 10% because it becomes a little dicier to assume that they can perpetuate that growth forever. And the weighted average cost of capital, the, the required return basically from, the, from investors in Starbucks is 12%. So we're going to start off by mapping out the free cash flows. The, the one for 06 is the one that was reported. And then for future years, we're going to multiply that by the, by the given growth factor four years of 20% growth and then 10% after that. So our free cash flow is growing, growing, growing. And then we take our cash flow amounts and discount them at the chosen discount rate, 12%, to the power of the appropriate number of years into the future. And once we do all that math, we get a overall valuation of 20 billion, 20.8 billion. Well, why are you saying, wow, that sounds pretty high. They only had uh, 270 million in net income. Yeah, but we know that they're going to be able to, sus to sustain positive net income for years and years and years into the future. We're going to discount that all to the present. So yeah, we're going to wind up with a substantial valuation for a, a very large company. Now we're going to subtract out the debt. The debt is relatively tiny compared to the overall valuation. So the, the equity share of, their com of the company's value is 20.6 billion. And then we divide that by the total number of shares outstanding and bada boom, that gives us an estimate of price per share, also known as the company's stock value. So again, we use a procedure like this and this is what equities analysts would do. They would estimate those uh, cash flows over time and find the present values, subtract the debt, divide it by the number of shares. And then that's what they use as a benchmark. So if they go out there and see that Starbucks shares are trading for $25 today, they think that's a good value. Let's buy. Okay. If Starbucks shares are trading for 28, they're going to sell, sell short, or avoid it. You know, look for another investment. So this is a kind of financial tools that you can see that uh, analysts use, either within the company or outside of the company. Discounted cash flow and present value. This is this is just bread and butter of uh, financial analysis. We'll stop there and uh, we'll jump over into the homework tutorial where we will set up problems like this in Excel and we'll practice, practice, practice using Excel's very user-friendly toolkit of present value and net present value calculations.